just get started. Good afternoon. I'm Greg Farley. It's nice to be speaking about something that's not administrative. So, I'm a 35-year teacher who's been in administration for the last couple of years. So it's nice to be able to talk about a research topic. This is actually a research topic of mine and some colleagues. Um, but my intention today is to have a conversation, try to ask you to consider a perspective that I think you may or may not be aware of and consider alternatives to how we currently manage, um, really how we manage a resource. So I also want to make an upfront comment. I actually love cats. So I had a colleague who's not here today. I may call them up and ask where they were. But they do keep kitties. They're one of the people I'll probably reference indirectly with these examples. But they're convinced I'm an anti-catite. I'm not. <laughs> Love kitties. There's few things more comfortable. I remember this many, many years as a child. A young man even lying on a sofa near a fireplace with a cat on your chest in the wintertime reading a book. There are few things that are more relaxing than that cat doing a kneading thing in your sweater. So, like cats. I also have other interests. I'm a zoologist because I love diversity and I love animals. So, there's different sides to this. This is a photo of an ornithologist by training. That's a bird. I won't use the name, but it's a relative of our chickadees. So this is a photo from Europe. It's actually a photo from England. But I think what I'd like you to get out of this picture, which is from the New York Times article referenced here from a couple of years ago, is that's a hefty kitty. So it's not a skinny kitty. It's certainly not a starving kitty. It's a perfectly well-fed, probably indoor house cat who was let out to use the loo, since this is an image from England. And this is a secondary consequence of what, what the kitty does. So we're going to talk a lot about um, behavior. And approximately, it's about the behavior of kitties. Ultimately, the conversation today is really about the behavior of, of us. So it's really a, an issue that I would view as more sociological and psychological than it is biological. So the question that was asked in this article, it's about a, a paper published by McDonald in um, 2015 from a study in England, is if pet owners, so we're really getting, I've worked on this issue now for, frankly, almost a decade. We've gone away from kind of looking at the biology of cats to starting to look at the biology of this organism. Um, so this is the question the researchers asked. If, if owners were, in fact, made aware of the degree to which their cats who they left outside or whom they fed and allowed to live outside had impacts on wildlife, would they be willing to change their behavior? And the there would be the human's behavior, not the kitty's behavior. We're going to learn that cats act like most organisms instinctively. And so would people be willing to change how they treat their, their animals? And so I'll answer that question the, at the back end of my, I don't know, 15 odd slides. You can't train a cat not to hunt. No. Alligators, as my daughter says so beautifully, this is one of her phrases, alligators going to alligate. <laughs> <laughs> summarizes it well. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the second article, which is more contemporary, which also gets at the psychological component, is um, a piece of this challenge is kind of a hoarding component that people have with cats. I'll note we typically don't allow people to hoard goats. Um, we certainly don't let people afford dogs. Um, thank goodness. So it does happen with cats. So there's large numbers. There's a certain um, fulfillment that comes with having these um, very beautiful, um, endearing little creatures that you take care of and that you make very distinctive personal connections with. Many people that have large colonies of cats that they care for have a name for every kitty. They know every cat. They're individuals. They, they grow up with them. They age. Perfectly reasonable. Well, let's cut that. Let's cut to the chase. Find me a baby mammal that's not cute. And cats have co-evolved with humans for millennia. They're, they're they're endearing little creatures. So this particular article, which is more recent, was a building in uh, the part of the world I'm from, Queens, New York. Demolition was stopped because no, someone noticed that there was a colony of cats that had been maintained in the building by a neighbor. So they found a nice empty space took care of these animals as they thought was appropriate. The animals bred, animals expanded to fill said space. Cats don't pay taxes. The building was stopped from being demolished. Kitties were captured. And then we'll talk more about kind of the outcome of those kinds of efforts to um, 
reintegrate cats into society. This is a recidivism issue. <laughs> I so miss teaching. I never get to use my Eric Gillick like sense of humor in the meetings I'm in most days. So the reason I'm the reason I'm absolutely involved in this was starting a decade ago. I had a 20-year bird banding study on this campus. So on the bottom axis here you see like 40 years of numbers. I came to this campus in 1995. I inherited 20 plus years of data from the ornithologists before me who captured birds every fall and counted them, and took biological measurements, et cetera, et cetera. I added my 20 odd years to that study. Um, not to talk about it today, but this is the largest study of bird populations in this part of the country. It's a significant data set. Um, my goal is another person in the Department of Biological Sciences in the next iteration, hopefully next year or two, will continue to study. So there'll be another 20 odd year piece after that, and it'll still be the longest continuous study of bird populations. Really pretty cool. But as that study continued, one of the realities that no jive literally got me thinking about administration and not the research I was doing was this reality. And so we would meet every fall from two weeks before classes began with student volunteers, like really great students, two weeks before courses began students are on campus with me. 6 a.m. in the morning, we meet at Albertson Hall, we walk out to near the Robbins Center, we catch birds for four hours, and we do this six days a week, no overload pay, this is just kind of the stuff you do with students, and we did it until Halloween. And so, I noticed as I was walking out there sometimes, and the cross-country team at 6.15 is running across the bridge in the other direction, there would be cats kind of trailing us. And if I changed my time of arrival, kitties would be ahead of me or kitties would be behind me. And so behind this building is a cat colony that's maintained by several employees on campus um, in a variety of buildings. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But cats are fed there, but cats would, on a daily basis, take a stroll, it's only about 150 meters, out to my bird banding site, and these are photos from the site. And help themselves to the animals that I have captured in an effort to do research with students. So we ban these birds, they fly literally to Nicaragua and Peru, unless of course they're eaten, and then their flying days are over. So that impacted the study to such a degree that this photo was taken by me, I'd sit at the end of some of the nets to prevent animals from being killed, the birds I'm capturing by the feral cats that were wandering around the study site. And that had such an impact that I really had to reevaluate whether I was investing time appropriately. So that's what kind of got me thinking about the issue. Um, so I started to do some reading, and there's a fair, fair amount of contemporary peer-reviewed literature on this subject. So I am an academic. We will discriminate today between peer-reviewed work and um, information you can read on, on a website that anyone in the room could create for whatever reason. But this is an estimate based on three different data sets on U.S. kitty numbers. It's interesting. It's veterinary services, it's the pet food industry, and it's a third item I can't recall off the cuff. So it's three indices of, of how many cats we probably have in households in the U.S. The data have plateaued. So I checked 2017 data last night, um, and they have pretty much plateaued around 95 million animals. So that's an estimate of house cats present in the United States. A percentage of these animals are house cats that are in the house. Excuse me, don't leave the house. A percentage are kitties that are let out of the house to use the restrooms. So that's another pet <coughs> health issue we could talk about. They defecate and urinate outside. They don't limit themselves to just your property, depending on where you live. They wander into neighbors' yards, into sandboxes, into convenient little places like playgrounds, defecate, urinate multiple times per day. We also have a feral cat population that's out there. And these are animals that, by definition, are not um, capable of living with humans. So they don't have the companionship component anymore. So they no longer are capable of being moved into a home and becoming, and I mean this very sincerely, a loving member of your household. We have domestic pets in our house. They're, I assure you they're on the bed. They're part of the family. So I get that. I'm not um, anti-domestic animal nor am I anti Kitty. But we're looking at rather significant numbers where we could have in this country, this is U.S., on the order of 180 to 200 million predators that are out there on a regular basis doing what these predators 
have been evolved to do for literally millions of years. They're good at it. They're pros. And so these are some estimates from a meeting of the American Ornithologists Union, of which I'm a member, is actually the fourth International Ornithological Congress in Vancouver. And I was in a room, and it's happened a few times in my career, where you just kind of feel you're at a paper that you're never going to forget. And so when these data hit the screen, all of us were simply stunned. So let's just look at the figure. This is per annum United States. This is not Italy. This issue occurs in Tunisia. This issue occurs in Belize. So we're dealing with an estimate of roughly 2 billion individual birds killed per year by cats. Feral cats or domesticated cats spending time outside of the, the family's home during part of the day. Um, Historically, the biggest issue going back 25 years, going back to post-grad school for me, the biggest issue we were dealing with that was an anthropogenic, meaning a human-induced cause of bird mortality, was, was clear glass. So buildings are put up and animals just don't quite have the skill sometimes to perceive that image, and they fly into glass, and many of us have seen that. Um, automobiles, um, towers, wires, there are other issues of anthropogenic mortality, but this is a not only is it a doozy, it's the singularly largest piece. But then I hit this. I'm an ornithologist, so I'm focusing on birds. Check these estimates out. So this will also age me, because I will use the phrase mind-blowing. These are mind-blowing figures. Over 10 billion mammals. So we're talking squirrels. We're talking squirrels. We're talking rodents. We're talking reptiles, amphibians, and again, there's value. People have lived with cats for some time. One of the great values of cats, other than the companionship piece, the psychological joy of having this, I don't know, this nasty fanged creature who loves you, um, <laughs> is they're great at rodent control. They're pros. And they're, they will knock out. They're wonderful on farms. They're wonderful if you've lived in homes with rodent issues. They're great to have around. They're, they're professional. But they tend to therefore kill anything that moves. So when I show these figures, there's an experiment that I recommend you do not try at home, but here's what you do. So you take your cat and do this with your friends. So each of you, I'm a scientist, just do the following experiment. Each of you take one of these kinds of kitties. Someone take a neutered or spayed cat. Someone else take a well-fed cat. Someone take a random kitty that you grabbed from off the street. Put each kitty in your private bathroom. Shut the door. Throw in living organisms. Return and see about the fate of said living organisms. So here are your sample organisms cricket, rodent, lizard, frog, turtle, yellow, and blue bird. Every instance, the cat will do what cats do. Their instinct is to chase moving objects. They'll pin it, they'll bite it, they'll kill it. They may consume it, they may not consume it, but the point is they're dead. And this is the issue from an ornithologist's perspective. From a conservation biology perspective is this is a controllable issue. We're much more likely to be able to control mortality due to cats than we are the um, presence of clear glass in our environment or the presence of moving objects on roads. This is one we've got a little bit of a better chance of. Now I'm also not dealing with the other mortality factors that affect living things including our own. That could be toxic chemicals in the environment, it could be changes in climate that we have no control over. It could be a variety of other factors. But this is one we actually have a really good chance to get a handle on if we would reevaluate, I'd argue, if we reevaluate re our how we value things. And that's what's so hard. Changing behavior is a bitch. So let's learn a little bit about the kitties. Just a perfect picture here. I could claim this is a photo taken of the little schoolhouse. It's not. But I've been out there enough as I could have taken this picture at the little schoolhouse. We have a pretty good population out there, as you'll learn. So cats are opportunistic predators or generalists. They don't specialize on a particular species of snail. They specialize on meat. So they kill a variety of things. Look at their jaws. Look at how they're structured. There's evidence in numerous peer-reviewed literature that cats that are neutered, i.e. they've had their gonads removed, are just as likely to kill as those that are not. <coughs> on a lot of uh, websites, I'll reference a few in a few minutes, there's indications that studies have suggested the opposite. 
This is what researchers do. When you look at that peer-reviewed literature, there is a single paper that references it can happen, but it's an anecdote. Some of the animals they sampled who were neutered killed less than animals that weren't neutered. But when you aggregate the sample, much less look at samples across time and space from numerous other studies, there is clear evidence that neutering and spaying has zero effect on the probability of a cat killing prey. It doesn't matter if they're well fed, it doesn't matter if they're neutered, what matters is that they're cats and they have access to prey. Um, photo in the upper right, again I won't share the anecdotes, I could talk about this all day. There's ample evidence, particularly in islands, of cats literally hunting organisms to extinction. Um, a classic example of an island off New Zealand where the only specimens we have of a particular species of wren is the nine individuals dropped outside the door of the lighthouse keeper. He showed up, brought a cat. Each of the consecutive days, first nine days he lived there, there was a wren at the outside door of the lighthouse. No one on planet Earth has ever seen that organism since or seen one alive. Just those nine individuals. So the cat wiped out literally a species. A cat. Mr. I used to know the cat's name. Steve Trout was like this. I couldn't remember him. It wasn't Boots, but it was some classic kitty name. So anyway, they can have significant effects on islands, but islands are really reflections of nature. You can have local areas, such as our campus, where we could have vertebrates really removed to the point of extinction, just given the density of these <coughs> predators, even if they're fat and happy. So these are images that reflect <coughs> observations of mine, not my photos, but observations of mine in the one mile I walk near 17th Street to 27th, walking our dogs. So I have seen cats with these items in their mouths. There's a neighbor or two on my route that has ordered cats. So butterflies were a classic moving object. Any of us who have kitties, ping pong balls were always popular. Any moving object with little green light, little laser. We've got a bat in this image that may seem surprising, but again, it is a moving warm object. Um, I had a cat in my youth that was a rabbit killer. Incredible. Cat ate everything. Everything. Ate everything but the tail and the cecum, which is a dead end piece of the large intestine. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. Can't leave the head, can't leave the feet. Can't eat at all. So cats are pros. They're good. You know we just said rabbits. Right? <laughs> I'm a biologist. And open my freezer for your next visit. So lizards, etc. I'm sorry, Cheryl, that was a little off, a little too much. Um, if you're interested, there's been some very good research in the last five years where cameras have been put on cats in an effort to get back to my original question. If owners were made aware of the activities of their children, their feline children, would they adjust the behavior of their household? So that's the pending question of my probably too long talk. And you'll see where these cats go. They cover greater distances than you would anticipate. They're well fed and they go outside and kill things. And the prey they return to your back door, which is a behavior some of them manifest, is not a direct reflection of the number of animals they kill. They return a percentage slightly less than half of the animals they kill to your house as that little reward of, yeah, it's a relationship. Greg, I love you, you feed me and water me, here is a skink. <laughs> <laughs> and so getting to the psychological piece, um, throughout the country, and not just this country, I've seen this in places I've traveled in Europe as well, in the last 20 odd years, there's an effort to find locations to maintain the lives of feral cats. So one piece of this component is house cats left outside. I'd ask you to reevaluate if you have a cat, whether your kitty needs to go out all the time, unsupervised. I literally mean that. But the cat should be out wandering, defecating, urinating, and potentially killing wildlife. If your pet, please consider controlling it, managing it, loving it, eating the separate piece of this is the feral cat population, which are kept in these facilities. These animals are not capable of moving into people's homes. You would not have this animal sleeping with you with a child. And they're maintained for the life of the cat. The intention of this location, these locations are to not euthanize any animals. <clears throat> so they're spayed or neutered at the expense of the organization or, or a volunteer veterinarian. Um, they continue to be fed and the, tr the Phrasing that's used if you look at websites is trap, neuter, release. So the animals are occasionally trapped, they're all neutered, they're all released. The idea is that population growth will go to zero. So if everybody in the population is sterile, 
All we're doing is feeding them. The lives of these kitties will end at a nice natural cat life. And I think it's a nice concept. The other thing we don't talk about enough is they do get care. They are fed. The cats at the little schoolhouse were fed last I checked on a daily basis. I'm wondering if anyone locally would know, but I, I kind of go by there occasionally, and I think that's a normal piece of the process is keeping these animals relatively well maintained. Um, what we have to recognize is having these large colonies of cats have some significant issues. And since we don't capture all of them, invariably, these populations do not stabilize. They do not decline as animals age and die of normal mortality. They continue to increase because we feed them and we do not successfully capture and neuter all of them. So virtually every state in the union has some of these. I did a sabbatical on a beach site in the eastern US. It also drew me into this topic. I was dealing with uh, seabirds that have a flightless stage after they hatch for 35 days. And adjacent to the site I worked on in a state park with endangered species, literally adjacent to it was a trap new to release colony. So you have a nice conflict that's sociological. We have wildlife interest to maintain an endangered species population, and we had a group of people in that location that wanted to maintain a colony of cats. So both parties were well intended. They had unintended conflicts of interest like that. What we've learned from peer-reviewed literature, so I'm going to go back to scientific studies, is that there are two examples in the entirety of the U.S. where trapping to release programs have worked. They're on two university campuses, one in Texas, one in Florida. Literally hundreds of volunteers, just like in this room, and every individual cat in that location was captured and neutered. That works. If everybody's captured and neutered, the population by definition will decline because individuals die. But unless you have that level of interest and contribution, and relatively low <coughs> veterinary care for neutering and spaying, the population will invariably go up. On our campus, we have a relatively small percentage of our animals that are effectively trapped and therefore neutered, so our campus population continues to grow up. We also have another in interesting problem here. We have students that will leave campus at the end of the semester in the neighborhood right across the creek, and their kitties typically migrate onto campus because we supply them with food. So we have an immigration issue. Don't misinterpret that, but that's what it is. It's an animal immigration issue. We also have people who drop animals off because they know that they're cared for on campus. There's food, there's housing, and there's the potential for veterinary care. So we have two sources of immigration. We have insufficient sources of population control by neutering, and so our population continues to go up. And that story is present all around the country. These are beautiful little ads for locations where you can manage your cats and put them out there and people will volunteer. But what's creating is that first graph of this growth to 90 million feral cats in the country, all of whom do what kitties do. So we know, again, through scientific studies, that TNR and the F is what I'm putting in here. Trap, neuter, release, and feeding does not control cat populations. In fact, it enhances them and they continue to grow. We'll note the exceptions, but we don't make rules based on um, n equals two when we have n over a thousand. Unfortunately, we have examples that don't work. Uh, we get significant concentrations of predators. Uh, campus security on this campus has been involved for several years. We now have increasing numbers of raccoons, skunks, and possums on campus because we have the adequate food supply. So we have these other issues that make the problem worse. So now we have a concentration, not just of kitty predators, but all these other predators, further <coughs> reducing native wildlife populations. <coughs> For trap, neuter, and release to work, we don't need any kitties coming into the population, which is not at play here. Estimates of modeling, we typically need somewhere about 75 to 90% of the animals have to be sterilized for a population to remain stable and then decline by that. Um, we are not remotely approaching that number. As I said, our number is around 20% um, So let's go back to the original article. And this is really fascinating. I'm looking at Dr. Brink because this, this is his discipline. So the initial question, again, the study was done in the UK, but I don't think culturally we're dealing with big differences in terms of the love cat carers have for their cats. But if owners were given information, so these animals were tracked, individual tra cats had cameras on them, individual cats were tracked, 
to see what they did every day, how much prey they killed, what kind of prey, how many animals they brought home, etc. Owners were given the information. Gary, Little Bootsy is doing this every day of the week. Will you make an adjustment? The answer was, I love the language. I mean, that's, I mean how do you, there, there's no wiggle room here, you know? It's like, it's unequivocal and it's emphatic. Translated to, hell, no, I'm not changing. <laughs> And that's okay, that's who we are. This is what, you know, this is how people are. So if you're curious, the kitty cam video, video sources out there in Google are pretty impressive. You'll see where your cat goes, you see what your cat does um, as a sample. It might surprise you. It's not all healthy, happy viewer. And then I thought I'd put this up. So this is always a nice conversation ender. But, you know, this is a policy in, in this particular city. And so I like this. You know, animal problems, I mean, this is, I don't know if you know the animal, probably most of you do not know the animal control staff in this town. They're professionals, they're really good at what they do. They're actually, um, they're, off, they're police officers, they're first responders in terms of their role, so they have extensive training, and they get that human component very well. So, animal problems begin with people. And that's, that's really very, very clean. So, there are problems when you let your pets roam free. There are problems when you let your pets breed uncontrolled. So again, this is the examples. These are the kinds of examples I love. So I like to garden. It's one of the things I like to do when I relax. My daffodils are all up in the front yard. Front yard looks great. Tulips will be up. I've got leaves. Tulips will be up in about a week. My irises will be up after that. Um, I love it. I would be really upset if I had neighbors who had sheep. <laughs> we have a flock of sheep on the farm under Dr. Cranwell's guidance. We have a wonderful set of new things on our campus farm. We've added a flock of sheep. We brought sheep back. We've added goats. They are housed, frankly, in a beautiful new building, which we're finishing this week on the campus farm, appropriately managed by professional staff, fed, housed, given veterinary care. They're not allowed to roam in Cheryl's and Dr. Duffy's neighborhood. That's a different standard. You know, we just don't let it happen. We certainly don't let packs of wild dogs, this is one that should get everyone's attention, chase our children home from school. I'm just thinking that's one where the citizenry would probably say, we'll take care of this problem on our own. Since we've got a pack of dogs chasing kids home from the law firm as they get out. So certain kinds of pets in the feral department are out of bounds, dogs, pigs, goats, and this one isn't, and I don't really know why. I mean, they're all cute when they're young. These baby pigs are just as cute as they look. I don't know why. And then another piece of this is when animals are out and about, our domesticated animals, when we don't care for them, when we let them breed uncontrollably, there are other issues. And there is a serious public health issue. There's several diseases that cats can carry, rabies being one of them. Estimates by the Center of Disease Control is there are more rabid feral cats right now than bats or skunks or other mammals. So it's a big public health issue. Toxoplasmus is a significant issue for uh, pregnant women. Um, just picking again the colony on campus, the proximity of those defecating, urinating animals multiple times a day to our dormitories is a bad move by us. And when you start looking at numbers, they do reproduce. This is what animals do. We make copies of ourselves at varying rates. And last but not least, since ultimately the cats are there about being cared for by people, it's really not very humane. The reason I'm having this conversation with you guys today is I now live in a different building in Hammond Hall. I've seen a lot of cats. Our population is going up again. And you look at cats midwinter, and there's some pretty sad-ass kitties. There's some kitties that I think humanely are in a position to be euthanized. We're not kindly caring for these animals. We are actually setting a percentage of them up for a rather unpleasant it's a personal perception it's not scientific but um, i know how we treat our animals at home it wouldn't be to have that starving diseasey kitty run around until it dies in december so um ironically i planned this about three months ago because i'm a masochist and i want to bring the issue up again but one of our um graduate students one of biology's graduate students, I guess it's no longer my home, uh, just graduated, just finished his thesis about two weeks ago. I happened to be on that committee. Brian Gaston studied this colony on campus along with another colony on campus and two in a different part of town. These are his estimates. We're the, we're the heavy line. 
But the interesting thing is this is the trap neutering release column. So this is when we have the peak capturing on campus, where there's a student group focusing on capturing as many animals as they could, and they never broke 40%. So they never captured half. Remember, we need 75 to 90% captured. They never got it. There's significant mortality in every colony in haze, managed or otherwise in winter. Cats die in winter like many animals do. So again, if our goal is care, um, we should probably reconsider how we take care of our animals. So anyway, that's my pitch on kitties. Um, feel free to let me know if you have other insights or feel this is unfairly philocentric in a bad way. <laughs> How did Brian estimate the total numbers were? Uh, mark recapture. So there's a program, um, software program, Mark. The old school method was you would run ratios of the animals you mark that you recite and the animals that aren't marked and you recite. And so it's, it's a chi square like probability. And so he knew, he put Clairol, it was very funny to read this in the thesis, Clairol with a trademark. He used Clairol dye, captured the kitties, and everybody, dark kitties got a blonde patch, and blonde kitties got a black patch, <laughs> different patterns. And so his kitties were all marked, so he knew who, you know, who you were and who I was. So, <clears throat> that chart of bird populations, what on earth happened in the 1970s, I think it was? Yeah. It's the third yeah. slide where it's... I think if you think about the sources of data, I wonder if that's not a, you know, a correlate with just pet care changing form. It wasn't your grandparents just having kitties on the farm that managed. It was people bringing kitties in the house. You know, it would have been the baby boomer era and pet care took off. I'm sure, oh, I know what it was. The other index, I remember the third one. So it was pet food sales, it was veterinary care, and it was total sales of of cat-related um, products. So they're highly correlated, three items. So I, I don't know this, but I would just postulate that that's when the cat feeding industry took off, right? You know, that's when, and I, again, I'd be curious, veterinarians would probably be a great source of this to see if we had animal practice numbers or some other index from K-State Pet School, you know, because they, that reflected that growth. Does that represent a growth in the U.S.? <coughs> House cats? I bet it probably does. Yeah, I don't know, in the 30s, I don't know if people are keeping kitties in the house. I just don't see it. I, I don't know. That would be my hypothesis. What I found more remember? interesting is that it plateaus. <laughs> What's that? Since you don't remember? <laughs> Greg, did you plot that also against like human <laughs> population growth? No, but in this country, we certainly didn't grow at that rate over that 20 year period. But that's another factor, you're right? Think of US population, as they say, post depression is a baby boomer. Yeah. No, Cheryl, I don't know. <laughs> but I found it more interesting that it plateaued. I assumed it would keep going up, and it hasn't. So that's kind of interesting. So maybe education works. Maybe people are limiting the number of kids. How many, capacity. Carrying capacity. It's a carrying capacity of, of American homes. For Millennials houses. can't get jobs and so they're staying at home, so it's reducing the number of actual households. And most places where you rent, you can't have Yes, pets. that is true. You can't have pets. But and kitties are a good to buy things. Right. Kitties are a good pet though. Oh, they're great, yeah. You know, you could you can leave, not to be mean, but I mean you can take care of your kitty, you can leave overnight. Yeah, they're super low maintenance, they're independent enough for you not here every hour of the day. You can be here all day and your kitty's fine. Exactly, not like a dog, I would say. Yeah. Now how many kitties can you have in a house? Maybe that's the other index. Well, there's a lot of kitties, I think. There's a four, there's a four, four pet, pet rule. rule. For animals that are, again, producing waste out of doors, there's a four pet rule. In the county, um, I would have to think there isn't so people could have livestock and other things, but there's a four pet rule in the city. Yeah. I have two cats and they're unable to eradicate the species of the red laser dot. Right. <laughs> Despite being exposed <laughs> daily. Every day. So you go red. I know Eric goes green. I thought you went green. I bet you never saw a mouse in your house though. That's right. They are great. They're, they're tremendous mouse killers. 
In theory, yes, but I seem to have gotten three cats in the world that just can't kill anything. <laughs> one, one animal has been killed by a cat in my home, and that's because Tuck the Monster Destroyer got so excited to see a spider that he accidentally stepped on it. <laughs> Unintentional. Right, just kind of the springy. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and who was that? Tom Tom Monster Destroyer. Tom Tom Monster Destroyer. Yeah. Of course. He's lovely. That's probably the best cat name in the room. <laughs> Does anyone think they have a cat name better than that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, mine were Surf and Tiger. Ooh, I have a tiger. Yeah. Bradley. Do you have a, a suggestion for dealing with feral cats other than the trap neuter release or just make yeah, that more know. effective? He was hoping no one would ask that question. Now, in, my, in my usual way, I think I'll answer a different question first. I do think the um, Audubon Society and even our local Humane Society, of which we're members, have done an excellent job of edu trying to educate the public about the activities of their cat. So one of the bigger movements about five years ago was to have keep your kitty indoors during migration. So birds are starting to migrate now. This morning was very cold. You see a lot of cold, tired birds standing on the ground outside. So I think that's helped. I have a neighbor who brings his kitty out on a leash. I've never interacted with the gentleman, but he, he's a student. And that's just what he does because he's worried about the cat running away or something. So I think the house cat piece we're getting better at. I think the feral cat piece is, or free roaming, depending on which term you want to use, we have to make decisions. It's an invasive, we're talking about invasive species. If we're looking at kudzu or other kinds of invasive, that's a plant, invasive snails, uh, zebra mussels. Um, we have to limit the population, and the only way to limit the population is is untimely death. I think we have to make decisions to euthanize some individuals. I mean, virtually every city in the country has those difficult decisions about what percentage of animals in their facilities cannot be adopted out. A job I, I will be the first to admit I could never have. I donate money because there are certain things in life I can't do, and that's I worked for veterinarians for years as a kid. Couldn't do it. That's um, so why I couldn't be a vet. Can't make. I'm not. I'm not good at those life and death decisions. But I, I think we have to do that clear at some level and just say we cannot allow this non-native species to grow in the wild at <coughs> unregulated rates unless we're willing to live with equivalent dis declines of amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. I'd rather live in a world where I see warblers and robins uh, and butterflies and blizzards outside my window, and just a bunch of cats. But that may be viewed as a bias. But as a, as a naturalist, that's my gig. I love, love diversity, but I think we have to make those decisions. And it's hard, it's psychology. It's gonna be really, really hard conversation. That's just one person's opinion. Yes? So what would the ideal feral cat population be? Um, I, I, ideally, I'd go 50% of current. I think like any invasive species, eradication is wildly unrealistic. In a continent like ours, we have to deal with a pragmatic number, and I'd say 50%. You know, It's the administrator and me now. It's all about compromise, so I'll hit 50. That seems reasonable. On an island, I think it should be zero. Um, New Zealand prides itself in its indigenous wildlife, much of which is unique on planet Earth and they are dealing with active eradication programs for non-native predators, stouts, weasels, mongoose, and cats. Uh, there are actually chemicals out there that are cat-specific, felicides. As offensive as this may be, they drop them from plains on islands where there's native wildlife that occurs nowhere else on planet Earth. As a biologist, I'm okay with species living on that island and nowhere else, and cats being everywhere else except that island. So I think in some places, zero. Pragmatically, I'll hit half. But it's a tough question. And again, we won't, we won't always agree on any big issue. I don't think people, large groups of people agree on it. We just try to work together. Have you seen any data on why cat owners are apathetic or reluctant to, um, you said change their behavior, but I'm assuming, I'm assuming it's mainly stop letting them out right. and running free. Right. I, Is it, I think it's an it's a area that I have no expertise in, so I'd suggest it's psychology. Um, I don't know. Anyone know the behavior. literature? Yeah, you would want to know why. Right, let's, I'm thinking it's one or two reasons. Either it's more convenient for them, they don't have to worry about the cat right. tearing things up or, or crapping. Or the other thing is just, well, I, you know, I think my cat has a more fulfilling life if I can let him go out and explore or go yeah. out and explore. Right. So I was going to ask you, um, 
What about, and I know there's several problems, this wouldn't address all of them, but as far as killing wildlife, if you hang a bell around uh, of their neck, doesn't that make yes. it very hard, for, much harder? It for deters, them? but it's not effective uh, for animals that are, say, I'll, you may think this is silly, but I'll pick the butterflies that are not going to uh, respond to sound. Right. Uh, birds in migration, they get into a physiological state where they're, um, instead of being predator averse, they're somewhat predator ignorant. Mm -hmm. And their sole focus is on getting enough calories ingested for the next 24 hour cycle to stay alive. And so you can get from here to that mouse to a wild bird when they're in that state of hyperphagy. All they need is calories. If they don't get calories, they're dead anyway. So they've evolved to focus on getting food. So bells, lights, my talking doesn't have any effect from the animals in that state. So bells do work to some degree, but it depends on the situation. Getting back to your original question, anyone know the psychology literature? How likely are parents to take responsibility for antisocial activities of their children? And I don't mean that recklessly. I think we, 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 I'll look in the mirror, probably humans, we can probably be a little biased towards those we love and care for. So I don't know if it's different with the cat. That's what I was going to say. I don't know. I think we all have different angles on this, but I wonder if we're good at looking in the mirror and saying, yeah, you know, my kid's the vandal. He's not going out for the next year. Well, my cat is much more human than these other animals. But yeah, I think cats. there is a certain piece of it. Yeah, we personalize the kitties have names. We love them. They're in your house. Mr. Boots can't do anything. It's not, Mr. Boots isn't like those other kitties. <laughs> That's what I think a piece of it is. Mr. Boots is not like those other kitties. So I'm curious with, it, um, I guess, the catch, neuter, and release strategy right. of a feral cat population, right. you're not sure how many feral cats there really are. Is there a reason why you focus on neutering the males? Oh, no. When I say neuter, I tried to do neuter and spay. Neuter I tried to say that. Okay. Um, the, if one's interested in population control, the reproductive unit that's best to limit would be female animals, if that's the goal. Um, there are... In our capture estimates, there's a wildly disproportionate male bias in the population. It's very interesting. There's more than enough cat sperm out there on planet Earth to produce the next generations of kitties. So, no, this would be both neutering and spaying. One very practical angle that can be taken is it's a much less invasive and less expensive procedure to neuter a cat. Even 25 years away, I could probably do it in five minutes, and I'm not a professional. Um, Know, a, a surgical process like spaying is a far more significant operation and so maybe that's one reason different groups would do neutering versus spaying but I meant both I meant sterilization in the, in the general sense. as hard as that is for some to comprehend but that's just one method but the challenge with TNR is you can sterilize away but as long as you have immigration and reproduction and feed them the population invariably grows it has it's going to grow unless you have the world's worst winter. But then they come back again, and you just knock the population back for five years and process the genes. So. Did anyone know we have this colony over here? Is that, have any of you, oh, here's a better question. Hillary, do you mind one second? How many of you have seen a cat in the last week wandering on campus? How many of you have seen more than one kitty identified by pelage color? Yeah. I was gonna say in a month, and I thought that's silly. Let's just ask them last week. So they're out. They're in the Has anyone tried to pet said kitties? Successfully? I got you're, within like two feet. I was going to say, you're so. good. If you got a hand on, you're good. I've tried. They're just not. These are, again, these are I not domestic. Two feet away, and then. Yeah. Well, that's, again, it's not the world's best life as a domesticated animal. I like the goat reference, Dr. Cranwell. Did you agree with that? So, yeah. Goats and gardens? I thought that was a good reference. Thank you for keeping your animals housed in a quality facility away from our gardens. You're welcome. And if you could just do something about your cat. Sorry, Hillary, you were much. I apologize. And those studies that looked at numbers of uh, mammals and birds, and how do they know what's killed by cats and what's killed by birds? That's just estimates. We look at prey killing rates of, say, any mesocarnivore, so a, a skunk or a raccoon, a possum, cat, and just estimate. Oh. The, uh, I don't know of data on those other carnivores. I do know the kitty cam data are quantifiable, 
but I don't know the literature well enough, but I'm, I'm supposing people have done the same thing with, I don't know with wild animals, I don't think. I don't know if a raccoon is gonna take that device off. Knowing raccoons, I would think they would, right? It would be a, a, a race whether they kill anything between now and they rip it off. So I don't, I think that's based on estimates of their normal pregnancy. So thank you, I hope I didn't take too much time. I didn't, so that's good. Yeah. I don't want to let you. Yeah. Thank you for attending and asking questions.